One of my favorite adventurous activities I used to like doing when I was younger was exploring abandoned buildings. I've been in abandoned schools, banks, industrial plants, churches, hotels, mines, tunnels, and office buildings. It's pretty dangerous, but I liked it. This one time I was exploring an old hospital with a friend, and as we were walking through it, we heard a noise in one of the rooms. We looked inside, and there was a cat sitting there, slowly waving its tail back and forth, staring at us. And right in the middle of the room was an empty cat food bowl. The cat seemed to be living there, and someone was feeding it. That was strange, but we kept walking down the long corridor of this abandoned hospital. We heard a noise behind us. I quickly turned around, and I swore I saw a door swing close way at the end of the hallway. But it was so far away, and it was so quick that maybe I didn't see it. A lot of the windows were broken in this building, and the wind was blowing, so I just stood there in the middle of the hall, and I stared down it, frozen, looking to see if any of the doors would just swing open or close by themselves. But nothing. No movement. No sound. Did I see someone, or was this my imagination? This creeped us out, so we went back down the hallway to leave. When we got to the room where that cat was, we looked in it. The cat food bowl was now filled, but the cat was nowhere to be found, and a few other doors that were open are now closed. Without seeing anyone at all, we knew for sure someone was in this abandoned building with us, and they probably saw us and were watching us. We got out of there pretty quick after that and drove home. Have you ever been in a situation like this, though, where you're positive that something or someone was there watching you, but you couldn't quite figure it out? These are true stories from the dark side of the internet. I'm Jack Resider. This is Darknet Diaries. We have a big story here, and there's a lot to cover. So let's just get right into it and meet our guest. What's your name, and what do you do? Mm, One second. It's not a hard question. (laughs) (laughs) I got to think about which name I want to use. No, no, I actually drink a water all of a sudden. Okay. Um, So I'm Cooper Quinton. I am a senior staff technologist on EFF's Threat Lab. Threat Lab? There's a threat lab at EFF? Yeah. So Electronic Frontier Foundation has a new project called Threat Lab. And our mission is to research and help stop targeted threats against at-risk populations. So this is like lawyers, human rights lawyers, activists, journalists around the world that are being targeted with um, malware or other digital surveillance techniques. So let's back up here for a minute. The EFF is the Electronic Frontier Foundation. It's a nonprofit organization, and it has a goal of protecting our civil liberties online. We have them to thank for standing up for us when our digital rights are being threatened. It's a great group of people full of lawyers and activists and researchers, and Cooper here is working with them in their threat lab. But the threat lab is actually a brand new thing within the EFF, and there's an interesting story about how all that came to be, and it all starts with Operation Me- Manual? Ah, yes. Um, Operation Manal. What's a, what's a Manal? It's named after the Manal cat or palace cat, which is native to the steppes of Kazakhstan. Okay, so there's a cat in the steppes of Kazakhstan. It's a really expressive, amazing cat. And I highly recommend looking up pictures of the mantle. Oh, this is great. There's like exotic creatures and places in this story already. I love it. Go on. Operation Mantle started when EFF was representing a woman named Irina Petrushova, who is the editor-in-chief of an independent newspaper, which is formerly out of Kazakhstan, called Respublika. Respublika had been Kazakhstan's uh, only source of independent journalism. Right. So here's the first person of our story, Irina Petrushova. Not only is she a reporter for Respublika, but she's also the founder of this independent news source in Kazakhstan. Now, specifically, she was writing stories and doing reporting on the corruption that goes on within the government of Kazakhstan. 
There were a series of financial scandals that she wrote about, and the president often hires family and friends to fill certain roles, even though there are people much more qualified and willing to fill those roles. And you should know a little about the president of Kazakhstan. This is the first president of Kazakhstan ever. He came to power in 1990, and he stayed there until he retired this year. Yeah, there were elections, but they didn't appear to be free or fair at all. And some even go so far as to say Kazakhstan is an authoritarian regime. So when Irina published articles exposing the corruption of this authoritarian regime, somebody really didn't like this and wanted to do everything they could to keep Irina quiet. Okay, so first they kill her dog and leave the head of the dog at the front door of the building where they published Respublica from. Jeez. Then they leave a human skull in front of her office building with a note pinned to it saying, there will be no next time. And then they followed that up with firebombing her office. The office burned to the ground, and that's when she finally left Kazakhstan. She fled the country and moved to Russia. She thought maybe the government of Kazakhstan was behind these personal threats, but she didn't stick around to find out. She was scared for her life. But she continued to write for Respublika and publish articles about the government of Kazakhstan. And one day, a big story showed up. This giant dump of emails appeared online on a website called KazaWord. And these were emails leaked from Kazakhstan's government, from Kazakhstan's uh, president. When this giant dump of emails showed up on another website, Irina published stories about it. The Kazakhstan government was very upset again with Irina and decided to try to silence her. The government of Kazakhstan sued Respublika and Irina Petrushova in the New York District Court, claiming that they were responsible for this Kaza word dump of documents um, and tried to get their Respublika's reporting on this dump of documents taken down from the internet. The case gets underway in New York. Irina needed some help with this. At this time, Irina contacted us for legal help, and we started representing her in court because this would obviously be a violation of the First Amendment. Yeah, it is a violation. Journalists are allowed to publish documents that are factual in nature. And this judge looked favorably on Irina and the EFF and said Respublica does not need to take down the articles about the leaked emails, which was a victory for Irina and the EFF. And perhaps historically, the EFF would have stopped there and that would have been the end of the case. But the EFF has a new interest in malware that is associated to things like this now. At that same time, she and her brother, who is also an editor, started receiving spear phishing emails. Which were designed to look like they were coming from other activists in Kazakhstan and human rights lawyers working with Kazakh people. These spear phishing emails contained attachments that looked like Word docs or PDFs, but which were in fact malware. One of the things the EFF does is educate people on the dangers of like being a journalist that might be a target for hackers. Yes, exactly. So we had given her some security training, and when she got these emails, she thought they were a little bit suspicious. So she sent them to us. We... St- you know, started looking at them, quickly figured out that the attachments were malware, and then started taking apart the malware to figure out what might be the source of this. So this team from EFF started investigating these Word docs and PDF docs. And they found that when you open these attachments, it will go download a piece of malware called JRAT. You embed an exploit in a PDF or a Word doc that the person opens, and then that exploit goes and downloads and installs JRAT. And then once JRAT is running, it can do a lot of different things. It can turn on your camera, it can capture your screen, it can record audio ambiently in the room, it can go through your files on your computer and create files or delete files or download files. Um, You can spawn a shell to remotely run commands on the computer and, and a bunch more stuff. And the neat thing about JRAT is that it works on Windows, Linux, and Mac computers. 
The rat part of this JRAT malware stands for Remote Access Trojan, which means when a user gets infected with JRAT, the hacker can then remote control that computer, allowing them to download stuff or interact with that computer. And at the time, you could buy this piece of malware at JRAT.io for about $40 in Bitcoin. So this wasn't a sophisticated or expensive piece of malware at all. But a few more emails came in with more attachments and a second piece of malware, which also was discovered, called Banduke. And uh, specifically, Banduke was developed by a guy who goes by the name Prince Ali. We'll learn more about Prince Ali later, but Banduke did a lot of the same things that JRAT did. Now, as Cooper and the team at EFF discovered this, they knew they were dealing with something more serious. The first reaction is like, wow, we really have something here, right? This isn't just crimeware. This isn't somebody trying to, you know, steal her credit cards. This is actually somebody trying to undertake digital espionage, right? This is somebody actually trying to spy on her. See, there are a few types of hackers out there. There's like the common crimeware hackers, which usually are like a spray and pray kind of hacking. They'll just scan the whole internet looking for vulnerabilities, or they'll send out thousands of phishing emails. But then there are the targeted hackers. And these people have a specific objective on a target. And because these phishing emails were crafted just for Irina personally, and the malware wasn't like a Bitcoin miner or ransomware or anything, then this likely means somebody was actively trying to spy on her. And it's scary and dangerous to be the target of a hacker like this. We inform her, and she informs her friends and her family and her staff. And they start sending us more suspicious emails. And we we get a bunch. And we get a bunch that all contain JRAT or the other uh, malware called Banduk. Her brother started getting phishing emails, her family, other people at Respublica, and she was getting more emails too. This was getting more serious now. So we start looking into the malware and we find the command and control servers. So these are the servers that the malware actually talks to. These are the servers that the malware sends any files that it gets back to. Basically, these are the servers that let the person running the malware tell the malware what to do. With malware like this, there's often an intermediary computer that files are staged on, uploaded to, and connections are made. And that's what this command and control server is. So when you open a PDF, your computer will then download the malware from that server. And when you get infected, your computer will upload data to that server. So you need this server in order for the malware to be successful. And the team at EFF discovered eight different domain names used by this malware and two different command and control servers. And each of them were hosted by companies notorious for hosting possibly illegal content and protecting its users. So yeah, again, this doesn't seem like your typical crimeware. We we figured that at least the people who were going after Respublica and after Irina Petrushova were likely doing this on behalf of the government of Kazakhstan. The the government of Kazakhstan is clearly after her, right? They're clearly very upset with her for um, posting negative things about the government. But see, it's hard to tell for sure. There just isn't any smoking gun. And it's kind of like a puzzle where, like, most of the pieces are all together and you can pretty much tell what the puzzle is going to look like, but you still need that, like, final few pieces to really know for sure. Okay, remember those emails that got leaked, which were the official Kazakhstan government emails? One of them stood out to Cooper. One of the things we learned from the dump of emails is that the president of Kazakhstan had taken out a contract with a private intelligence company called Arcanum Global Intelligence to perform what they called a surveillance, data extraction, and full-spectrum cyber operation mission to surveil Kazakhstan's only opposition politician, um, whose name is Abliazov. His last name is Abliazov. The, 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 I mean, we haven't, we just got started. We haven't even got to the good stuff yet. And I'm already just blown away by the, by the magnitude this whole thing is. Oh, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's, this is the biggest, this is the deepest rabbit hole I've ever been down. Okay, so there's sort of a smoking gun that says Kazakhstan has historically hired independent hacking teams to spy on the enemy. Well, the, you know, the, the interesting thing and sort of the like thesis that I want to get at is that it's not that Kazakhstan has any cyber skill, 
you know, I hate using that word, but let's go with it. Okay. Right. It's not that they have any, like, it's not that they have any, I mean, not any. I'm sure that, I'm sure there are many fine hackers in Kazakhstan, right? But like, the government does not have a cyber war unit, right? It's, it's not like, um, you know, they're not, they don't have like, what is it, Israel's, um, 8200. Yeah, 8200. Exactly. They don't have, exactly. Like, but what they have is companies that do have this capability that are more than happy to sell it to any nation state that will pay. These four higher hacking teams really fascinate me. And that's something I'm going to have to dig into for a future episode. Because there are a lot of groups like this, which will carry out hacks or spying or doing signals intelligence for clients. Because we know this is something that, you know, digital surveillance, digital extraction missions, right, is the term they use. We know that that is something Kazakhstan is interested in. All of the spear phishing emails seem to demonstrate like a pretty good knowledge of Kazakhstan, of politics in Kazakhstan and what might entice Kazakh activists to, you know, click through and open emails. The majority of the targets that we found were either embroiled in legal disputes with the government of Kazakhstan or are the family members or associates of people involved in those disputes. So, so we feel like we have a pretty good link to Kazakhstan, although no, you know, it's all circumstantial evidence. They also discovered some malware activity on mobile phones what they found were files that looked like they were uploaded from mobile phones, which led us to believe that there was probably a mobile component to this campaign, although we never actually found uh, at the time of publish- publishing, we never found the mobile malware. Eva Galperin was also a big part of this research, and you might know her from Twitter as Eva Side. So Cooper and Eva put this data together and put it in a report called Operation Mantle. Again, Manel being a native cat to Kazakhstan, and they just like cats, so why not? The report was published, and they gave a presentation at Black Hat, a big security conference in Las Vegas. Our talk today is presented by Cooper Quinton and Eva Galperin. Hi there. Welcome to When Governments Attack, also known as I got a letter from the government the other day because I couldn't resist a public enemy reference. We're going to be talking a little bit about... People were a little freaked out with this report, concerned about how easy it is for Kazakhstan to ramp up a cyber espionage program by outsourcing it. And people wondered, how far does this spying go? At the end of the Black Hat talk, Eva said, I'm fairly certain that Cooper and I are less good at this than many of the people who are in this room right now. Uh, So I beg you to go look at our report and see the many loose ends that we have left, the many areas in which more research is needed. Uh, It would not be that difficult for people with more skills than us and more resources than us uh, to be helpful. And this call for help worked. A few new people saw this report and looked into it and found some things that they could help with. And when we come back, we'll hear what they found. So, unbeknownst to us, two researchers at Lookout, the mobile security company, took an interest in this report. And specifically, they took an interest in the part of the report that said, we believe that there are mobile components to this based on exfiltrated mobile files that we found, but we weren't able to find the samples. Lookout, being a mobile security company, has a big database of mobile malware and of the samples and of the um, you know domains that they've seen, the malicious domains that they've seen. So Mike and Andrew, the researchers that look out, start combing through their database. And after a little while, they find some malware, which is talking to the same domains that we had discovered in the Operation Mantle report. So at this point, they reach out to us and they say, hey, we have this interesting mobile malware. We would love for you guys to take a look at it. We think that it's related to Operation Mantle. The team at Lookout called this mobile malware PALAS, P-A-L-L-A-S, which is the other name for the Mantle cat. So they decided to get together and come to an agreement. Now, sort of our arrangement was, OK, they will they will look into the mobile malware. We will sort of consult with them and think, you know, right 
write a blog post together and think about what this might, you know, what this might mean geopolitically. The team at EFF and the team at Lookout, they team up. They find a couple of new things related to this whole campaign. So we were about to publish a small blog post saying, hey, we found some more mobile malware related to Operation Mantle. um, And here it is. And that's all, folks. When I remembered that several months ago, when I was researching Operation Mantle, we had found all the uploaded files from the malware, you know, from people's infected computers on the command and control servers. When Cooper was investigating Operation Mantle, he watched how the malware behaved. And he noticed that it does things like take screenshots and then uploads that to the command and control server. And it puts them in a specific directory. Well, it just so happens that that directory was visible to anyone on the internet. In other words, the data was in a location on the file system that you could visit with a web browser without authentication or anything, without even an index file that would hide the file names. So you could basically, like, one of the servers was um, axroot.com. And, you know, you would go to axroot.com slash four-letter campaign ID slash pictures. And you would see the list of every picture that had been uploaded by that infection. Whoa, this is a big deal. Cooper had the ability to view and download all the data that this hacking crew had stolen from its victims. This is what Cooper used to build his report on, but forgot to mention it to the Lookout team until just now. You know, I went to Lookout and I said, oh, hey, do you think that it might be useful to look at some of this exfiltrated data? And they, you know, their jobs dropped and they were like, are you kidding? Yes. Why didn't you say this months ago? (laughs) Yes. Let us. Yes. Jesus. Give us the URLs. You know, this was like two days before we were going to publish this little blog post, right? I showed them the data. We started looking at the data and we're like, oh, wait, there's actually something much bigger going on here. This looks like a new, a totally new target. Like it was a target that wasn't Kazakhstan related? Is that what you're saying? Exactly. It was a target that wasn't Kazakhstan related. Mm. We start downloading all of the data that we can find and we end up with several gigabytes worth of data. It's pretty similar data from what we got before, you know, um, audio recordings, video recordings, files. But we also found SMS messages, call records, WhatsApp, Telegram, and Skype databases, um, and Wi-Fi details. This data provides the Lookout team a lot more information to investigate. But not only that, there appears to be more victims since the report was published. And so the teams decided not to publish a blog post because the investigation just got a lot more interesting. Exactly. That's exactly what happens. This is way bigger than what you're looking at. So we start looking into, we start looking into this new data and we quickly discover that most of the infections are infections of people in Lebanon or on the border of Lebanon and Syria. Looking through it, it appears to be Mostly Lebanese civilians. There's also um, some military people in there. There's um, some some activists in there. Just a just a really wide swath of uh, Lebanese society. Okay. Huh. What do you think? When you see like okay, Lebanon, this is getting bigger. What is going through your mind now? Yeah, so now it's a real mystery because previously we had assumed that you know this was the work of the work of a company working on behalf of Kazakhstan, right? But why would the government of Kazakhstan be spying on Lebanese civilians? Right? What's the re- what's the relation between Kazakhstan and Lebanon? Lebanon. There's not much of a relationship actually. Or vice versa, right? If this is the Lebanese, why would they be spying on Kazakh dissidents? Hmm, this is kind of blowing the theory now that the hackers behind this might be from the Kazakhstan government. All of a sudden, the motives and signals just don't add up. The teams keep analyzing the data, pouring through gigs of photos and text messages and emails and keystrokes and Wi-Fi hotspot data and more. Everything this malware would upload to the servers, the team would then download and take a look at it. 
Then they found another victim, a Vietnamese cigarette importer, and this confused them even more. Around this time, Lookout positively identifies the mobile malware being used in this hacking campaign. Um, and it's not the, the malware itself is pretty standard spyware stuff, right? Typical spyware mobile malware will enable the microphone, copy text messages, emails, turn the camera on, read your private messages, that sort of thing. But what's interesting about it is that it is masquerading as encrypted messaging applications. So the the malware is disguised as copies of WhatsApp, Signal, Telegram, uh, Tor, and Threema. And the the attackers have actually set up a website called secureandroid.info that has the backdoored trojanized copies of all of these apps. Doing a little bit more investigation, the teams figured out how this whole thing went down. Hackers would send an email or a text to an Android phone user saying, hey, we need to talk, but let's do it in a secure way. Download WhatsApp from this URL and then we can have a secure chat. And the link to download the app would be to the hacker's version of WhatsApp. And, and the, the really interesting thing is, so, so these were all, in addition to being spyware, working versions of the app still. So, you know, when you downloaded this fake version of WhatsApp or this fake version of Signal, you would be able to use it like the real version of WhatsApp or of Signal, but it would also be spying on you in the background, decrypting your encrypted messages and sending them to the command and control server. The teams at Lookout and EFF kept seeing more and more data being uploaded to the command and control servers, which gave them so much more stuff to go through. They were seeing many more than six domain names that were being run by this hacker crew. We found over 20 domains that were connected with this campaign. And the domains were things like adobeair.net, tweetsfb.com, of course, secureandroid.info, which is hilarious to this day Mm -hmm. because all it had was insecure Android. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, ArabLiveNews.com, um, and, and the one I mentioned before, axroot.com, skypeupdate.com, and a bunch more. Each of these sites had a different purpose in this attack. For instance, secureandroid.info was where emails would point the victim to download the malicious program. And tweetsfb.com had exact replicas of the Twitter and Facebook login pages, which were probably used to trick users to enter their username and password in order to steal their logins. And some of these other domains were used to upload the stolen data to And the whole time, tons more victims are being hit with this, which means tons more data is being uploaded to these servers. Data which Cooper and the team can see. And we find just a massive amount of data, right? We we found 81 gigabytes of data just on adobeair.net. Oh my gosh. It's like, it's like all adding up in my head now. Like, you have behind the scenes access to all the files these hackers are stealing and it's tons of data yeah. and it's very sensitive private stuff are you like downloading it all and looking at it yeah and it's you know it, it's it's you know I'll, I'll tell you jack it's really it's it, it's heavy stuff to look at because you're you're you have to look through all this data to figure out who the victims are who the threat actors are and you're really looking through people's very personal data. You start looking through the pictures uploaded from people's phones, and you see pictures of people's kids and like pictures from war zones. You, know, you have to find ways to look through all these things to try to figure out what's going on here and try to figure out, you know, are these victims related to each other in some way? Why are they being spied on? And it's awful you know you you feel like a terrible human being and you have to stop so the team combs through the data photo by photo text by text and they would piece together the puzzle they would figure out how the victim got infected by looking for suspicious text messages of people asking them to download an app and they try to find info on this victim like where they are in the world and what their job was and why they might be the target for this kind of spyware attack exactly well, and you know, at some point, what we did was just started to write a script that would take the IP addresses of all the victims and you know map them out in the world. 
Using GeoIP lookup tools, you can see what city that IP comes from in the world. And the map they made displayed victims being all over the world, not just Kazakhstan and Lebanon, but so many more countries. In this map, we've got victims in Lebanon, Kazakhstan, the United States, China, France, Germany, India, Italy, Jordan, Nepal, the Netherlands, Pakistan, the Philippines, Qatar, Russia, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, Switzerland, Syria, Thailand, Venezuela, and Vietnam. Holy cow. All over the world. How many countries is that? Uh, So we found victims in a total of 21 countries all over the world. Okay. So at this point, it's so it's it's a global threat. What are you thinking at this point? So at this point, we're thinking, wow, whoever this is, they have a really large operation going on here. And it's starting to seem less and less likely that this is the work of any one government directly. What one government would have an interest in spying on so many different people in so many different countries, yet have such low-tech hacking tools and techniques? Good point, yeah. Such bad operational security, right? Like, you can think of several governments that might have interest in spying all over the world, right? Russia, China, the U.S., Israel. But they all have fantastic hackers working for them. They wouldn't be caught dead with such an amateurish operation. Trying to figure out who's behind this attack is hard, but there's one method you could use to try to figure it out, and it's called the diamond model. Picture a shape of a diamond in your head. It has four points, right? Well, each point represents one piece of the puzzle. Who did it? How did they do it? Who did they do it to? And what tools did they use to do it? In this case, we don't know who did it, but we do know the rest. How they did it was using the malware that was found. Who they did it to, well, there's a list of victims around the world. And what they used was 20 different domains and a couple command and control servers. So this is sort of like algebra, and you want to solve for who's doing the hacking. We know three of the parts of the puzzle, and just knowing that helps us narrow this down a lot. Since the victims were all dissidents, activists, lawyers, and journalists, and the point of the malware was simply to spy on these people... We know it's probably not a profit-driven hack. So you rule out, like, common criminals. Then you can start assuming this is, like, a nation-state actor carrying out these attacks. Because who else would want to spy on activists and journalists exposing corrupt governments? But because the malware and tools are not that sophisticated and they didn't secure their command and control servers very well, it doesn't seem like a very good group of hackers, which kind of rules out the more advanced nation-state actors. And this is the sort of path that you go down when you try to figure out who's behind something like this. This is called attribution. I mean, it, it's at at some point, are you like hard? Is it hard to sleep at night while you're researching this? Like, you, I mean, digging into the back door of a of a you know a, a threat actor's server, and then seeing the size of this, you can't just like lay down and go to bed like a baby. Oh, no, no. There was... This definitely took up all of my... All of my brain space, all of my time, all of my thinking power for several months while I was working on it. There was really, you know, nothing else. And, yeah, sleeping and uh, thinking about who might come for us (laughs) once we published this report was definitely... As the team at Lookout was putting this report together, they realized a problem. This whole hacking campaign was still active and live. And if they published this report, it might mean that other people could figure out where this command and control server was, then they could see all the sensitive stuff that was stolen from the victims. So Michael, the researcher at Lookout, emailed the hosting provider where the server was being hosted from and informed them of this hacking going on and asked them to take the server down. But the hosting provider protected their users, and instead of taking the site down, they forwarded the email to the hacker. And the hacker read this and emailed Michael at Lookout, denying the whole thing, saying that their software does not contain any malware and asked why they thought it was malicious. So Michael emails the hacker back. And said, hey, 
Um, maybe you've gotten hacked and your domain has been infected and we'd love to take a look at it and help you fix your security on your website. A bit cheeky, but okay, I get it. But no response from the hacker. A couple of days later, when we're looking at one of the infection URLs that we that we had previously found, um, we find that it, the URL has been replaced with a web page that says, Hi, Michael. Michael being the name of the researcher at Lookout that had emailed them. Oh, interesting. So the hacker knew that Michael was onto them, but the hacker kept hacking and didn't secure their site? It's like they didn't care if they were being watched. The other amazing thing that they left open is they left open this page called Apache Stats, which shows you in real time the logs of the server. It shows you in real time every URL that's being visited and the IP address that's visiting that URL. So we started logging all the URLs and logging all the IP addresses. And through that, we were able to get the IP addresses of the people visiting the admin URLs for the server. Ooh, now this is getting good. Knowing the IP addresses of who's connecting as an admin to the server will possibly give them a sense of what region in the world these hackers are in. By this point, the EFF and Lookout teams have gathered so much evidence and information from this hacking crew. Here's a list of the stuff they gathered. 264,000 files, 486,000 SMS messages, 250,000 contacts, 150,000 call records, 92,000 browsing history URLs, 1,000 authentication accounts, username and password combinations, uh, and 206,000 unique Wi-Fi SSIDs. Hackers had collected all this information from their victims, and the teams at EFF and Lookout scraped all this data from that website and analyzed it. And this is a massive amount of information to analyze. They had to build new tools to help categorize and organize the data. And while looking at this data, some of it suggested that the phones may not have been infected through phishing, since there were no phishing text messages or emails. Instead, some people's phones appear to have been confiscated, like at a border crossing or an airport, because after that, the phone would then become infected, and the first text messages uploaded to the hacker's servers were things like, I just got my phone back. With all this information collected, the EFF and Lookout teams decided to switch their attention to try to figure out who's behind this. So, well, so we start by looking at the IP addresses of the people that were logging into the admin sections of the command and control servers. And looking at those IP addresses, they were all from Ogero Telecom, which is owned by the government of Lebanon. And geolocating those IP addresses, um, they were specifically located in Beirut, in the museum district, in this sort of you know downtown Beirut. We were a little bit stuck there, right? We were like, why would people in Lebanon be spying on... I mean, it makes sense why they'd be spying on Lebanese people. Why would they also be spying on Kazakh people? Why would they also be spying on Vietnamese people and all of these other campaigns? So many questions at this point, but they're so deep into this. They wanted to solve this mystery. So they looked for more clues. One of the things this malware does is track what Wi-Fi networks the phone has connected to. One of the guys from Lookout decides to lay out all the Wi-Fi SSIDs on a heat map, which is like a spreadsheet to see if any infected phones had connected to the same SSIDs. When we graphed them out, we saw one big cluster of phones connecting to several different Wi-Fi access points. And then one little cluster where a few phones, a few different infected phones, had all connected to the same Wi-Fi access point. We looked at those phones deeper, and we discovered that they were all the first infected phones that had uploaded to the server. They looked at the data that these first infected phones had sent to the command and control server, and it all seemed like dummy data. Like they were test text messages and test emails and testing the downloading of infected apps. So we looked at those test devices, and they had all connected to this Wi-Fi called BLD3F6, which we took to mean possibly Building 3 Floor 6. Okay, so the team has a Wi-Fi SSID, BLD3F6, 
I would like to know where in the world this SSID is being broadcast. And you know what? There is a way to figure that out. There's an Android app called Wiggle, W-I-G-L-E, and hundreds of thousands of people install it and then drive around your town, your neighborhood, your street, and map out every SSID that's being broadcast. And this data is then uploaded to Wiggle's website for everyone to see. So if you have an SSID and want to know where it is in the world, you can cross-reference it with this website to find its location. We looked up the access point in Wiggle, and the access point is also in downtown Beirut in the museum district, centered near this big orange building and the French cultural embassy and a museum and, and a college. Whoa, these clues are really stacking up now. We wanted to find out more. We wanted to find out exactly where this was. So we sent somebody to Beirut to actually put boots on the ground and use a wireless antenna and figure out exactly what building this Wi-Fi was coming from. Jeez. Wow. This uh, this is a spy mission now. Yes. Yes. Suddenly this has turned into an international espionage mission. What that person found was that BLD3F6 was coming from the big orange building. And that big orange building was in the museum district in downtown Beirut, Lebanon. Which, by the way, was the only building around with six or more floors. It was the headquarter of Lebanon's General Directorate of General Security. Whoa, the Lebanese General Directorate of General Security is one of Lebanon's intelligence agencies. Its job is to collect intelligence to ensure national security and public order. Exactly. So so what we have now is a bunch of test devices that had only ever connected to this one Wi-Fi access point and no other phones that were infected had connected to this access point. This access point was in a building belonging to the General Directorate of General Security. GDGS is like Lebanon's FBI, CIA, and NSA, and Border Patrol, all rolled up into one. So while it's not a smoking gun, it strongly suggests that the Lebanese government is behind all of this hacking. If you remember earlier, I said that one of the pieces of malware used in this was written by a hacker named Prince Ali. Oh yeah, I do remember. Prince Ali wrote the Banduk malware you found earlier. I remember because Prince Ali is also the fake name Aladdin uses in the movie. Prince Ali is based in Lebanon. And we know that if you remember, you know, way back many years ago, when the hacking team emails were leaked by Phineas Fisher... I'll have to cover Hacking Team more in another episode because it's a good story. But for now, just know there's a company calling themselves the Hacking Team, and they're hackers for hire, essentially. And they often work for high-profile clients like government agencies. And one day, someone hacked into Hacking Team and exposed a lot of emails, letting us know what goes on in that company. One of the people that shows up in those emails is Prince Ali, applying for a job at Hacking Team. Another thing that shows up in those emails is Lebanon trying to hire hacking team to do some hacking and Kazakhstan trying to hire hacking team to do some hacking. Huh. So if I'm putting these pieces together, Ali may have gotten a job at hacking team. Well, this isn't really hacking team's MO. Yeah. We think that hacking team rejected Prince Ali and he or somebody else that that knows him has started their own full service hacking company right they run they will deploy the malware they will run the servers they will get the data they will do the hacking and they will write the reports for you wow so the evidence is suggesting that the Kazakhstan and Lebanese governments both hired this same crew to do spying on behalf of the government. And maybe Prince Ali is one of the members of this crew. And perhaps hiring contractors like this gives the government an easy out to deny their involvement, like hacking by proxy. It's crazy. Uh, is there a name for someone who does this? I've been trying to, um, I've been trying to popularize the term cyber mercenaries. 
I really want to sort of convey, you know, just how how shady these companies are, right? And and uh, I feel I feel like Cyber Mercenary kind of does that. I'm starting to think Prince Ali is the common thread to all this. Figure out who he is and who he's working for, and everything will unravel. What we know, you know, after this campaign is that somebody was hacking, doing hacking on both on behalf of both Lebanon and Kazakhstan. Some of that hacking took place directly out of the Lebanese GDGS offices. And one of the malware authors is Lebanese. And they also have a list of who the victims are and what kind of malware was used here. That's, those are the facts that we have. And, you know, sort of the, the picture that we've put together from that, this is a new company who has contacts with the GDGS, but also was able to figure out contacts with Kazakhstan and also has, you know, some other potentially, um, you know, crime campaigns going on uh, or potentially other espionage campaigns going on in Vietnam and in, you know, has also victims in the U.S. and in other parts of the world. And let's not forget that the leaked government official Kazakhstan emails show that the government of Kazakhstan was working with Arcanum, a hacker group for hire or a cyber mercenary group. And they also tried hiring the hacking team to do work. So it's now known that Kazakhstan does do stuff like this. And perhaps Prince Ali got a contract with GDGS and demonstrated to them on the sixth floor how he can hack into their phones, and that's why they were the first targets. And then this malware has sort of a self-service feature to it, so clients can just go log in the command and control server and see what's been uploaded. That's why the logins all seem to be coming from this orange building in downtown Beirut. At this point, the teams at EFF and Lookout feel like they've collected enough new information to publish not just a blog post, but a 49-page report outlining all of this. And they called that report Dark Caracal. Caracals are another cat. Um, specifically, the Caracal is native to Lebanon. And we called it Dark Caracal because this whole thing is such a mystery. It's all very dark and mysterious. We don't know... Really, in the end, we don't know who is behind this, right? We don't know anything about this, you know, what we presume is a company that's selling selling this service to all of these countries. We just know, you know, we see sort of the shadows of it, but we can't look directly at it. It's so much, It's it just seems so like big and shadowy, like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. To try to, to, try to put perspective on it, it's so difficult because it's just so hidden. Right. And you only get like, uh, you know, a couple tent poles here and there that you see, but you don't really get to see what's under the tent. Exactly. It's, yeah, it, you know, there's, there's so much more that I want to know. So for example, um, you know, the, the, so Prince Ali wrote Banduk, right? And Banduk has a very specific signature in the way that it communicates with the command and control server. Okay. Right. It always uses plain text beginning with three at signs and then tildes to separate each field of data. Okay. And when we looked at the mobile malware, which we called dark caracal, and when we looked at um, another brand new rat that we found uh, in, in researching dark caracal, and this looks very similar to JRAT, but it looks like somebody took a stab at writing, you know, sort of writing from scratch their own version of JRAT. So the interesting thing is that Crossrat, Banduk, and the Dark Caracal mobile malware all use the same scheme uh, to communicate with the command and control servers. Ooh, yeah, that's another big clue, I'd say. They all start with this at symbol, and then they all have their fields separated by a tilde and an exclamation mark. Um, and they have very similar fields to each other. So it looks like the same person wrote all of this malware. And we know that Prince Ali wrote Van Duke. <laughs> this is like, this is, you remember the game, playing the game Clue? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's like a real life game of Clue. So we released the report. We talked to a number of journalists. Specifically, we talked to some journalists at the Associated Press, who are some of the bravest journalists I know. 
because they actually went to the GDGS headquarters, confirmed that the BLD3F6 Wi-Fi access point was there at the headquarters, and then knocked on the door of the headquarters and demanded that the GDGS respond to the allegations in this report. GDGS told them to go away, that they didn't have any comments, um, except that it was probably all fake. The next day, the AP reporters went back, and the BLD3F6 Wi-Fi had mysteriously disappeared. The AP reporters kept pushing GDGS to make a comment about this report, and the Director Major General of the General Directorate of General Security responded. Yeah, so so basically the the director of GDGS, uh, you know, said we didn't do any such thing as is implicated here in this report. And even if we had, it would have been all entirely legal and for the good of the country of Lebanon. And furthermore, this is clearly a CIA or Mossad plot to defame Lebanon. I've been accused of many things, but this is the first time I've been accused of being a CIA and Mossad shill. So the news of this dark caracol campaign was pretty important. This hit all the major news outlets, and it was a big deal to discover. Yeah, so we gave a presentation about this at ShmooCon in Washington, D.C. And they gave a presentation at the Kaspersky Summit in Mexico, where they had all four of the people from the team to give the presentation on stage there. The core team that researched this, the the core four authors were myself and Eva and um, on the lookout side, uh, Mike Flossman and Andrew Bleach. So after seeing the success of this research from Cooper and Eva, this paved the way for EFF to create Threat Lab. There clearly is a need for more research to be done into the spyware that's targeting at-risk communities and activists. And research like this helps us all become more aware of the threats that are lurking in the shadows of the internet. I don't think this dark caracol hacking crew is anywhere close to being done, I think this is the new world we face, where corrupt governments are treating activists and journalists and human rights lawyers as the enemy to the country. And it's becoming easier than ever for a country to just ramp up its digital spying capabilities by outsourcing the job to cyber mercenaries. And if this report blew the cover for this hacking crew, the government could just hire the next one in line and start over. Whatever is going on, it's just out of focus, just out of reach. We have this illusion that our computers and phones are safe, but when a nation-state actor becomes your personal threat actor, your life is anything but safe. I think the internet and computers are the most magical and amazing things I've ever experienced. I'm deeply in love with it all. But stories like this remind me that the owls aren't what they appear to be. When you look down the long ethernet cable into the dark part of the net, the dark net sometimes looks back. You've been listening to Darknet Diaries. Thanks so much to Cooper for sharing this story with us. You can follow him on Twitter at CooperQ to see so many more interesting things that the Threat Lab is doing. Also, big thanks to Eva Galperin, Andrew Bleach, and Michael Flossman for the research that went into this report. It's amazing. Great stuff. Oh, and another thing that came out of this Threat Lab at EFF was that Eva Galperin has called for antivirus companies to flag stalkerware as malware. This is like commonly acquired software that's used to target domestic partners to spy on everything they're doing. And so far, Kaspersky and Lookout have agreed and are now flagging this as malware. So we have the EFF to thank for help mitigating stalkerware on phones. The Threat Lab also has an investigative journalist, Dave Moss, who's looking into whether there's any unlawful spying going on in law enforcement. Clearly, the team in the EFF Threat Lab is doing amazing work at investigating and exposing various kinds of spyware, and their efforts are making us more aware and safer as a society. Their work is far-reaching and impactful. And let me emphasize, EFF is a non-profit digital rights organization. So if you think their work is valuable, consider becoming a member and donating to help their cause. Or you can help the EFF by simply giving some of your time. Go to EFF.org slash Darknet Diaries to learn more. Oh, and if you want to hear another story from the EFF, check out episode 12 of this podcast where I go over their involvement in the crypto wars. This episode is created by me, the cyber tooth tiger, Jack Resider, and editing this episode is done by the dark Damien. 
Theme music is by the shadowy Breakmaster Cylinder. See you in two weeks.